December of 2016, we started um, in the tradition of, of Pete's group uh, centered here, a Smith Institute for the Study of Political Economy, uh, Philosophy and Political Economy. And the Smith Institute is for Adam Smith. And one of our missions is to reintegrate humanities and economics in the spirit of Adam Smith. The other part of our mission is to recombine research and undergraduate education as a discovery process in the spirit of Vernon Smith. And I'm going to be talking to you about that education part that I got from Vernon Smith in the tradition of Adam Smith. I understand that many of you have read his Nobel speech as part of a reading group uh, last year. And if there's a favorite sentence that encapsulates Vernon Smith's contribution to how I think about economics. It is the first one in the, sec in the second footnote in his Nobel lecture. He says, doing experimental economics has changed the way I think about economics. Now, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for experimental economics. I'm going to talk about those contributions in a minute. But the important part of the sentence is the part has changed the way I think about economics. And he elaborates further. He says, there are many reasons for this, but one of the most prominent is that designing and conducting experiments forces you to think through the process, rules, and procedures of an institution. Few, like Einstein, can perform detailed and imaginative mental experiments. Most of us need the challenge of real experiments to discipline our thinking. How is it that we think about the world as economists? And how is it Vernon Smith has helped me understand how to do that? By training and self-selection, your professors, economists in general, are three things. I would call them deep-seated consequentialists, methodological positivists, and serial nominalizers. What, what I mean by that? By consequentialists, I mean that we are concerned about the consequences of things. So when you were taught about how minimum wage worked, the punchline was that it creates unemployment, the consequences. When you talked about price, ceil uh, price ceilings and rent control, you talked about the consequences. That reduces the number of apartments that you're supplied, and the quality of the apartments starts to fall. You talked about price gouging and pri anti-price gouging laws. You talked about the consequences, how that makes disasters even worse. So we care about the consequences. So if your professors tell you that there's something called positive economics and normative economics and what you're doing in this class is just positive economics, when they say it's better to have less unemployment, that's moral. That's, making it, that's saying something moral. They're being consequentialist about it. That matters to us. And I want to take that through you as how you think about the world. Consequences matter, I would imagine, to you too. By a methodological positive, is we mean that we learn something objective about the world when we look at the outcomes of the actual world. And so we reject assumptions about how things work when we don't see the consequences. And I'm going to take you through some of those things when we talk about markets and your assumptions about how uh, supply and demand work. And our inclination, what I mean by serial nominalizers, what I mean by that is we like to create words to describe things that we're observing. We call them nouns. So uh, we might call them deep structural parameters, and we call them things like risk aversion, fairness, reciprocity, inequality aversion, ambiguity aversion, overconfidence, overoptimism. Those are things we like to call things we observe going on in markets. And so I want to take us back to the root of what it means to observe and then call things, give them different names. So it's from my casual observation that many economists were surprised at the content of Vernon's Nobel lecture, which was entitled Ecological and Constructivist Rationality in Economics. Having been awarded the prize for, quote, having established laboratory experiments as a tool in empirical economic analysis, especially in the study of alternative market mechanisms, I think many expected him to catalog the major findings of experimental economics in his prize lecture. After all, that's what he was awarded for. My colleague at the Economic Science Institute, David Porter, has described Vernon 
as a live interactive version of the Journal of Economic Literature. He knows all the literature that's out there. You can just ask him about it. But Vernon Smith is no cataloger. He's a synthesizer. And he synthesizes acutely aware that scientific inquiry is not wholly objective. That he himself is part of the scientific process. In his book, Rationality and Economics, Vernon quotes the Goethean scholar of science, Henri Bortoff, in the epigraph of chapter 10. Science believes itself to be objective, but is in essence subjective because the witness is compelled to answer questions which the scientist himself has formulated. Scientists never notice the circularity in this because they hear the voice of nature speaking, not realizing it is the transposed echo of their own voice. Now, as a reader of the chemist and philosopher of science, Michael Polanyi, Vernon might push back a little bit on Bortoff and say that science is neither wholly objective nor wholly subjective. Rather, science is personal. Insofar as sciences establish contact with the external world, like in a laboratory experiment, it's not subjective. But insofar as the inquiry is guided by our individual passions to learn something, it's not objective either. Designing and conducting economic experiments is, as Ludwig Wittgenstein says of philosophy, really more a working on oneself on one's own interpretation of one's way of seeing things and what one expects of them. What do I mean by that? So consider Vernon's first economic experiment published in the Journal of Political Economy in 1962. Of all of the Nobel laureates you're talking about this week, Vernon Smith is the only one still with us. He is still working at age 91. <laughs> And he started in 1956, running his first experiment. It took him six years to get that thing published in the Journal of Political Economy, and also I think he might explain it several times, trying to get, it, to get people to publish it. But what has come out of that paper is what's now called the canonical double auction experiment. And as I've heard him say many times, Vernon conducted his experiment in the spring of 1956 with the expectation that the results would deviate from the lessons you learn in your principles of microeconomics course. But I want you to note how just that observation is personal. His priors, his way of thinking about the world, was that the, com that the, the competitive equilibrium of supply and demand that you were taught and that he was taught would fail to organize the data in his experiment. But he was curious to see what might happen. He had a passion to explore his own interpretation of his economics training. Nature wasn't speaking to him. The transposed echo of his own voice led him to formulate the question and the experiment. And part of what I hope to take you through this lecture is that it helps you find your passion and take part of your education and leads you to question and take things further and to be curious about what you get out of your classes in economics. So let me start with the graph that almost all of you, if you've seen the principles of uh, microeconomics, you've seen before. What is this? It's a representation of the world. It represents the world out there, which means the world is big and messy and complicated, and we've distilled it to that. Blue line that goes out, downward sloping and a red line that goes up. Now, some of your professors might deduct five points from it because I haven't labeled the axes. So what are these axes? The vertical axis is the price and the, and the horizontal axis is the quantity. But we've taken this messy world and we put it this way. You'll see it's a little jagged there because your books, I'm pretty sure see it go like nice and smooth, right? a further abstraction of the world. These are jagged because the world is discrete. I went to Starbucks before coming here. I couldn't order 1.6 grande lattes. 
I had to order one or two. The world is discrete. Now you might wave your hands and say, but there's a lot of them so that it gets really, really tiny. True. But the world at its core is discrete. So that's why those things look a little jagged there. And we take that representation of all the willingness to buy for all the buyers out there and we just range it from highest to lowest. Again, there's no way nature orders things like that, generally. And notice what's missing in here. There's all notion of time. It's just quantity and prices over what time frame. There's no geography. That's all gone. And we're measuring it over something. We're, and the reason why we're doing that is because we want to say something about the world. But we can't handle everything, so we, this is what we want to handle. And we range them from highest to lowest. And then we look out there, and like, there's all the different people who can supply things. We'll put that in the red graph and we'll raise them from lowest to highest. And again, abstracting away time and geography. And then what you learn is that it has this very beautiful property. We call the competitive equilibrium that there's going to be a price, looks like in this one about 10, at which the quantity demanded by people out there equals the quantity supplied by other people out there. And that looks like it's about 15. Very simple, right? It looks beautiful. This is what you're expected to explain to your professors. This is what happens when you have supply and demand interacting. When you have people out there trying to buy and people out there trying to sell, it's that simple. This is the same model that Vernon got right after World War II when he's learning his econ classes. And he noticed that there were some assumptions that went along with it. So here's the pop quiz for those of you now I know who you have your hands up who have principles in micro, what are those four assumptions that gets you to this point? We say large numbers of buyers and sellers. We say that so then we can also draw that line smoothly. <laughs> large number of buyers and sellers, it's a homogeneous product, there's no substitutes for it, so, so uh, Starbucks grande green tea latte is not, is different, so that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about things like milk that don't, that, that are, um, homogenous, who then have easy entry and exit, so they're easy coming and going, and finally, complete information on supply and demand. So Vernon was being taught this, but at the same time, at a time where actually economists themselves didn't believe it. You're coming out of World War II, they didn't believe it at Harvard where he was getting his education. We're talking about administered prices, that markets aren't going to organize things. So it was in the book. They're being taught it. You're still being taught it 60-some years later. <laughs> and, but Vernon was skeptical about it. Your teachers are teaching it to you, and you're expecting you to come away saying, yeah, this is exactly how it works. Both cases, we want to examine our priors about why it works or doesn't work. And Vernon wasn't sure it was going to work. He was actually pretty sure that the world was so messy that all those things I took out of it aren't going to make it work. So what did he do? He went to the library. I don't know if you know what a library is. It's a place with books you walk into. You know, you're all used to going just to your computer or your phone, your iPad to find things. But he went to the library, and he didn't go to the economics section, because economists weren't thinking about actual how things worked in the world. We're going to just do it on our models and our, on paper. So he went to the finance section. He said, well, how do they organize? How do these really messy markets work? And so he looked up the rules for the New York Stock Exchange. He came across something called the double auction clearinghouse. So this was the rules by actual people, traders, markets, that look really messy when you see them going on, on, on in live. You know, that, all that crazy activity, particularly before computers. He says, well, how do they do it? What do they do? He looked up those rules, and here's how it works. So if you're a buyer, you walk in and you want to buy something, you want to buy one of the pork bellies, or you want to buy something, you put up a bid, you raise your card, you say, I want to buy, and you stated what it was. And sellers, raising their cards, and they're saying, here's what I'm willing to sell it at. Now, he was going to do a version where the Chicago Board of uh, Mercantile Exchange, where he was the, kind of the pit boss, the center, rather than everyone just doing it on floor, in, by themselves on the floor, but that's the way the New York Stock Exchange works. 
the, in Chicago, they, went, they all went through, through a pit boss. And that pit boss would call on people, and there were rules that when you bid, you had to be better than the current bid out there. Bids were always going up, so here's an example. Buyer 1 bid at 7, and then I'll, later on, buyer 3 bid 775, so it's going up. Sellers are all submitting asks. They're saying, I offered $8.50. Another seller says, I can do better than that, $8.25. Another seller says, I can come in at 8 And all this is going on, lots of activity. And at some point, either a buyer says, I accept seller's offer, or a seller says, I accept the buyer's offer, and then they have a trade. So I'll just put an example here, buyer 1 accepts seller's 5's offer. Those are the rules by which real people and actual markets go about trading. And Brendan says, I'm going to copy those. I'm going to create that same environment here with my students. On the first day of class, I'm going to see, nah, see if this thing really works. Because then we're going to have a conversation about what we're seeing in the book. It says it works, and we just did it something, and it didn't work. Turned out, it actually worked. But what happens here is you get something messier than what you saw before, right? That was a nice straight line, <laughs> price and quantity. You got contracts moving all over the place. It's messy. In fact, it's even messier than that. Here are some data from some high school students who are getting real, paid real cash for blowing around for trading, just like this, with me as the auctioneer. So the people who are buyers had a sheet in front of them and said, if they were to buy a unit, somewhere I'll say, on their sheet it said $10.25. They could resell it to me, the experimenter, for that amount. So if they could buy it for less than that, that's the profit they took home. So he made up values, said, I don't know what they are for the actual people in the world, but if we're here in my world, I'm going to give you some values. I'm going to say, here's the most you're willing to pay. So I know what that is. And he's going to tell the sellers out there, here's some costs on their sheet of paper. If you can sell for more than that, then you make that difference in profit. So all of this hurly-burly exercising is that we see these blue carrots there. These are bids by buyers. Somebody raised their card, they bid it. Another one came higher, kept on going, going, and going. At the same time, the sellers are raising their cards, and down come the sellers ask, and then they meet. Their first unit traded right there. Then see the second unit, just one bid, one ask, and they're, that's over. Same thing. And then as it period goes on, more and more activity, lots of activity towards the end, but it looks a lot messier than the story you're told in your book. But here's why Vernon ran the experiment the way he did. He knew things that you don't know about the world. You don't know what the supply is in the real world. You don't know what the demand is. All you see are prices and quantities out there. In his classroom, he knew exactly what they were. And here's what they were. See all those buyer values? Going from highest to lowest, seller cost going from lowest to highest. And those black lines are all the different contract prices. And you notice where they cross? At a price of $6.25, they trade 12 units. How many units did they trade? 12. And where are all those prices? Right here at the end, right smack dab in there. This is not any different than his original data. Same kind of converging process. This green area represents the sum of all the profits everybody was writing down. What do you notice about that sum? It fills the entire area there. Uh, those 12 lowest cost units and the 12 highest units of value all trade. They all made money. They got 100% of the gains from trade, their first period of trading, and they're in high school. None of them traded before. None of them knew anything. You didn't know anything about supply and demand when they were in Vernon's classes. They didn't know anything, and they did it. Vernon expected this to fail. It worked. So what do you do when you, when you fail, when you expect something to happen, and then it fails? Your first thing might be, oh, maybe it was a fluke, right? I just got lucky. Economics just got lucky here. Let me do it again. It worked again. He tried it the other time. It kept on working. He noticed something. Well, what's going on here is that that's a very pretty looking graph. Notice the area. 
here where the profits go to the sellers and the profits that go to the buyers, it's symmetric. It looks exactly the same. So go back to this world. He's like, well, maybe I just chose some special conditions that really made it work. I got lucky on that. It's the supply and demand that I chose. That was affecting what I'm doing. So notice what happened. He is questioning his thought process about why he chose what he did, and that might be affecting the results. So he thought, well, then what I can do is I'm going to change those supply and demand arrays. I'm going to change some of my own assumptions about building this world and to see if it still works. Why? Because his Harvard education had told him that this didn't, wasn't supposed to happen. But it's happening right there before his very eyes. The next thing he did was change the relative amounts of surplus the profits that the buyers and sellers have received if they traded the competitive equilibrium. So this is actually, these are graphs taken from his paper <laughs> from 1962. And so notice there's a lot more profits going to the sellers here at the competitive equilibrium and a lot more profits going to the buyers in the top one. He says, let's see, that explains why we got equal pressure. That's why the prices went to the competitive equilibrium. When I give more weight to the buyers or more weight to the sellers and profits, that, that's when it's not going to work. What does he find? This is deviations from the competitive price. And you notice in the top one, which was the top design, basically they are right in their competitive equilibrium price the whole time, even though you gave a lot more profit to the buyers. So it seems to be weighted a little more higher to the, to the sellers getting more of it. Let me get this straight. I give more surplus in the supply and demand arrays, but the sellers get some of it. Why would that be? And you notice the opposite effect here, here, where there's a lot more profit on the size, supply side, the buyers are getting it. These are prices below the competitive income that go up towards it, towards the end. So it looks like it still works, but if there's a lot more profit to be made from the sellers, the buyers are really aggressive and they get some of it at the beginning until it erodes. There's a lot more profit to be made off the buyers, given the design, the sellers grab it. So he learned something that he didn't expect. A, it still works, but B, there's a pro the supply and demand arrays give you the dynamic path, which you don't see in that picture in your textbook, some direction. So he changed, but it's still working. So he's going to say, I'm going to see if I can make this, I'm going to break it now. So he created this, what he calls very um, politically incorrect, swastika design. She said, so I'm going to show, see this blue here. At that price, there are more buyers than there could be sold by the sellers. And the competitive equilibrium is the price should go all the way up to the values, right? That means the buyers get zero money by the end of this. It should get, all go to the sellers. So he's trying to push it and break it. He can't seem to, it worked against his expectations, but he's starting to think, oh, maybe this double auction Maybe supply and demand really do work. So he's going to say, now, let me find some conditions where it falls apart. And then he also ran the alternative one, where there's a lot of supply. And so now the prices should collapse down to the costs, and we should get so, so sellers getting no money. And he's going to do this with the same groups of people. He's going to give them this first, and then he's going to switch it to this. And he's going to start with this, and then switch it to that. So it's a really strong test with the same people. And he says, if it doesn't work, then I know I found some boundary conditions that supply and demand, yeah, well, it generally works. But here's a case, well, I think it might fail. What happens? It still works. You'll see in the session here that the prices fall, and they come right down. You change it, prices go right on up. You can start going right on up. You change it, come right on down. You push it all the way to the extreme where they earn zero surplus and you still see supply and demand work. Where did all the fairness go that you expected maybe interfere with that? This led Vernon, so think about it. He tested his own, he went out there thinking, how do I think about the world? Does it really work that way? Well, let me see how the world works 
Let me bring that into my laboratory, test how I think about it, and I kept on working and working. It's a model for you to keep thinking about. You learn something in a book, test it. What would be the implications for it? Does it really work? I thought some, I didn't think the world worked this way, but this is what it seems to be happening. Interrogate it. Keep going with it. See where it takes you. Because where it took Vernon was, well, if I can do this with supply and demand, I can start thinking about economics like this in a very general way. I can start testing theories in general and try to discriminate among people who have competing ideas about how it works. I can compare environments, that's what I just described to you, changing supply and demand. Or I can compare institutions. Because when I went out and bought my, um, my grande green tea latte, I wasn't out there throwing up offers to buy, <laughs> bidding them against other people. And there weren't multiple Starbucks and coffee sellers out there saying, I'll come down in the price in real time. That's just not how my consumer goods work. So I said, oh, maybe that only works because of, some, of that particular institution, those particular rules that I went and got to the library. Well, what if I put in rules like when you go to the grocery store or you go to um, Starbucks? You can change, you can keep the same supply and demand, run it with those double auction rules, and then you say, well, let's just change it. Sellers just post prices and buyers take it or leave it. Because that's what you do when you go to the grocery store. That's retail markets all over the world. You just take the price, you either go in the store, or you don't. He started changing that. Guess what? Still works. This takes a lot more time. It's slower. But it'll get there. It takes some time. But he's saying, well, look, I can do that more generally. I can look at different things and compare the rules. So he started testing auction mechanisms. So he started looking with various co-authors. Economic theory tells you that if you take a sealed bid auction, that everyone submits a bid, and then you give it, you open up the bids, you, whoever has the highest bid, you say, you get to buy it, and here's how much you pay. You just tell me what you're willing to pay. That's what you pay. Now, economic theory tells us that that market works the same way as the way the Dutch sell flowers every morning, three football fields worth, with a clock. You have a literal clock with a price on it, and it starts ticking down. And it ticks down until somebody says, I buy. Economists will tell you that those should look exactly the same. You compare, you can actually change those institutions, run, lose the same values out there, run them through the same, same set of values, but change the rules on these people and see if it still works. Turns out, no, they don't. Dutch prices are always higher than when you have the sealed bid. But it opens up your way of thinking about the world. You're like, how do I think it, things are the same? Does it really work that way? Let me see. And then you can push boundaries and establish new regularities to, for you to think about the world. He's, he's changing economics, which was at the time very much a pencil and paper kind of thing, and making it an observation. I'm going to go out to the world, but I'm going to create the world right here in my classroom. And I want to see how it works. And then you test what you yourself think of it. So, economics became an observational science that it was not in the 50s and 60s. And so, I told you he was a synthesizer. So he started with these very specific examples of markets and things, but he saw a general pattern come out of it. So he generally called these things supply and demand, the environment, the costs, the values, the knowledge, the technology. That's just what's in the people. Then there are rules by which they interact. We call that the institution. And then things happen when these things interact. We have outcomes. That people have behavior that you have in, in, through the institution that tells you what kind of messages they send to the world. And those institutional rules execute trades. Things happen. But as an experimentalist, you can assess the performance of these various types of worlds. Because the invisible hand of Adam Smith that you've heard on earlier this week has become visible with those supply and demand arrays. You, they're visible with every one of those students submitting bids and asks. And so he synthesizes into a general way of thinking about the world and testing what he thinks how the world works. What happened about this? He continued to work on this for 20 years. 20 years later, he's still working on the supply and demand double auction experiment. He's still thinking about why it works the way it's, it's working. I recently had an anniversary of 20 years since I worked in my 
dissertation, I'm still not working on the same thing I did 20 years ago. I'm not thinking about it. Vernon is still in the back of his mind thinking about why is it working the way he's doing. He noticed the following things. He read Hayek, who Professor Caldwell talked about earlier this week, who wrote very famously in 1945, the most significant fact about this price system is the economy of knowledge with which it operates or how little the individual participants need to know in order to be able to take the right action. Your textbook will tell you that it is an assumption for it to work that you have to have a large number of buyers who have complete information of supply and demand. In his experiment, neither were the case. If you had three buyers and three sellers in the double auction, it still works. And they don't know anything about anyone else's supply or demand curves. It still works. And that's the most significant fact. Running reads this as, this is what I'm seeing in my laboratory experiments. People don't need to know anything about anyone else. What they need are some rules to get people to start expressing what they're willing to buy and what they're willing to sell at. And that is what Vernon took from that double auction experiment. That I don't even need to know all of that. And it still comes about. So in the form of a price, the market communicates all the information about everyone else that an individual needs to know. I don't need to know what anyone's value is. I just need to know what they're willing to pay for it. And every time they put in a bid, I knew that. Every single time sellers puts out an ask, you're like, oh, the other sellers realize, oh, that's what they're willing to sell at. I don't know what their cost is, but I know what they're willing to sell it at. And all of this coordinating happens with all these people who don't know each other. And that's how they're able to get 100% of the gains from trade. And here's what's interesting. Interacting non-cooperatively and impersonally, a market of individuals simultaneously maximizes A, an individual's return intentionally. When I go out to shop, when I go to Amazon, I'm always looking for the best deal. I'm intentionally trying to make myself better off every single day, every single trade. But what happens, what comes out of this, is that all the gains from trade are realized at least in his experiments. Now, if you ask my students, and I ask my students before they, before they see the results, how many of you think you could have done better? They all raise their hand. Yes, I could have done better. Because they don't know anything about anyone else. But the problem is they couldn't have done any better as a group. They got all the money possible. And this is exactly what Smith is talking about as Adam Smith, an end which was no part of his intention. No one aims in a market to make us all better off maximizing our gains from trade that are possible. No one individual is, has that aim, but we all work through the double auction experiment and we get there. Ludwig Wittgenstein says that the edifice of your pride has to be dismantled and that is terribly hard work. Vernon has said over and over that his subjects have disabused him of certain ideas about how economics work. To be able to say that, is you have to put down your own way of thinking and start listening to what you're seeing out there coming from the world. That is hard. It's terribly hard work. Vernon does it very well. Adam Smith in the Theory of Moral Sentiments, very 18th century British King's English, he says, actions of a beneficent tendency which proceed from proper motives seem alone to require reward because such alone are the approved objects of gratitude or excite the sympathetic gratitude of the spectator. Can I put that into 21st century English? If someone does something good for another person because she wants to do something good for another person, that action appears with nothing further needed to deserve reward by the other person. He's saying, we want to be good. Now, how does Adam Smith get there? How can he say that this is how he expects the world? He goes out there, just like Vernon, and asking, what do I see people doing? What are people like? And one thing he notices, and that's why he opens his book, is that people fellow feel with each other. We gravitate towards one another because we participate in the feeling of all those people around us. I don't know why they do that. But they do it. Turns out, humans aren't the only ones that do this. Mammals are pretty good at this in general. Primates really do it a lot. 
They want to be with each other. They feel each other's pain. So if two chimpanzees get into a fight and everyone else is watching them, the loser feels really uncomfortable, like, oh, no, I'm not, I, 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 I pissed off the alpha male. The alpha male feels that in the, in the loser and goes over and touches them on the arm and that relieves the suffering and the uncomfortableness of the losing. They just were fighting and the victor touches them. The victor feels that pain and relieves them of it. They're now back together and getting along. Chimpanzees do that. We do that. When we see somebody hurting, we want to gravitate towards them. And he's going to use that to explain why we're good to other people. The other thing we do, though, chimpanzees don't do this, is that we go and then we judge. If there's two people fighting, those of us watching are judging why they're fighting. We, we assess their motivations, their feeling and thinking about who's fighting and why they're doing it. So we don't just sit back and watch. We like, huh, that person had it coming to him. Or there's no reason. He's ganging up that person. There's no reason to do that. We judge what other people do. We judge how, what they're feeling and what they're thinking about it. Why? I don't know. We won't tell you that we're judging you, but we're judging you. And then we have this feeling, prompting thoughts that move us to action. And that thing is called gratitude. When somebody does something for you, you feel good. And that feeling good prompts us to do something. This is what all humans do. Now, it also works in the opposite direction. We'll call that resentment. If somebody hurts me, I resent that, and that prompts me to want to do something back. But for the, I'm just going to use them as one domain, that we have this gratitude. And then there are these other principles that humans do. Don't know why, but we just do it. Is that is, we look at our own sentiments, our own feeling and thinking, and we say, why would I, do I want to be that kind of person? I did something, oh, uh, I don't think I should have done that. Oh. It feels pretty good for helping that person today. We look at ourselves, and we examine how we feel. And when we do that, we want to be worthy of praise for doing it, even if no one else sees us. We also fear being blamed for something, even if we didn't do it especially, but if we did do something, we fear being blame, blameable for it. And so, in Therefore, when somebody does something good for me, I fill a feel with the reason for why they did it. I judge that, saying, well, there's, they have good reasons for why they're doing that for me. I want to be the kind of person that does good things back when they do good things for me. And so I go do something else for somebody else, or do it back to them. That's how you get, you get all these observations about how actual human beings work, and out of it you get this basic principle that people be good to other people who do things that are good for them. We just do it. But it builds in who we are as, as individuals. It's a one-shot game. People come into the laboratory. There are two people that are paired anonymously on a computer. Person one gets to choose the end of game, taking each to get $10. Person two, if they get to move, chooses 15 for person one and 25 for themselves, or can take it all. And you have the numbers here of what actual people do. Now, if you're only worried about your own money, everyone should just end the game because here's what person twos are going to do. They're going to take it all money. So why would I pass? I'm just going to take it all. But we see half the people ending up over there. 46 pairs, 30 other people. Half of them are ending up there. Other types of people are ending up over here. Why are they doing that? The first instinct, and this is what I describe people as economists as serial anomalizers, and Vernon will tell you this himself. He explained it by, whoops, he explained it by calling it reciprocity. He said reciprocity explains why person twos do something for person ones. But that's just calling it a name. <laughs> and he realized this later, 
when reading Adam Smith that Adam Smith was actually explaining why person twos give it to person one. Person one does something good for person two when they move down. Person two feels with them why they did that, wants to be the kind of person that does something back even though it, it's $15 less for them, and so they do it. Even though they don't even know this person, they don't even see this person, they're never going to meet this person again. So Adam Smith changed how Adam, Vernon Smith thinks about worlds when we interact with friends and families and neighbors, even if we don't even know directly who these people are. The point of, of this is that if we suspend our own beliefs about what we need to know to solve our models or teach a graph, and listen to what our participants or what you see in the outside world say through their actions, Experimental economics can change how you think about the price system. It can change how you think about social interactions. The problem is not just about how we think about marginal costs and marginal revenue in our textbook, but how real people go about their very real problem of buying and selling, or about how real people go about their very real problem of getting along with their friends, family, and neighbors in their community. To sincerely listen to laboratory experiment participants, to sincerely listen to what's going on out there in the outside world, means to take seriously the notion that other people may not see the problem the way we see the problem, which is rather humbling. And that is why the edifice of our pride is so hard to break down, that we have to take it and push down how we think about it and start listening to other people. Vernon, though, makes dismantling one's pride look easy. He is one of the most self-effacing scholars I know. He sets a high bar both in the laboratory and in everyday life. And it is his genuine modesty and honesty with himself and others that comprises the lens by which he has made a career of burning points. There is no more light in a genius than in any other honest man, says Ludwig Wittgenstein. But he has a particular kind of lens to concentrate this light into a burning point. Vernon has made a career of burning points, and the most significant of which is his example as how to be a model scientist and a model human being <coughs> as you think about economic science. And so there is that quotation that sums up Vernon, he is an everyday kind of person, but he has a way of just focusing it, and he does that by humbling the edifice of his own pride. Thank you. Um, in the beginning, you emphasized that Vernon uh, Smith wasn't expecting the outcome of his initial experiments. Do you know exactly what he was expecting to happen, or did he just really not? He's expecting this competitive equilibrium to not to come about, to not see it be efficient, to see, not, see prices that wouldn't look like what you predict, and you wouldn't see people trading that amount. He's just not expecting it to be work that well. Do you have any idea of like what? How would it fall apart? No. I, I haven't talked to him about how he expects it. That's a good question, actually. But he just suspected the theory to fail. Uh, first, thank you for the talk. I really enjoyed it. And it's not really a question, it's more a, I'm like airing a concern and trying to get your opinion. Uh, because when you mentioned that uh, when economists say this is better than that, we're in the realm of normativity. Uh, and in philosophy, like, there is even the claim that normative positive statements, like, you cannot distinguish them. They collapse. Uh, but in economics, there is still such a strong tradition of separating these things. I do think that it's impossible to be exclusively positive. Like, you just, you cannot do it. But how, how do we move this forward? Because it seems that we're just stuck. I think you have to realize that you, yourself as a scientist, are part of that. 
And I think the drive to make science objective, to make economics objective, is to say that I don't have to take responsibility for what I consider to be truth, what I f how I find truth. It's just out there. I'm just kind of discovering it, figuring it out, but it's just there. It's, it has nothing to do with me. But it, that can't be, because as, the, as that great quotation from Henri Vortov is, you're just not randomly deciding what you're working on. You're driven to go and study things. You're studying economics. You're studying other dis, uh, fields here at, at College of Charleston. And something's driving you to do that. that how you go about that, pursuing that passion is a moral question. Mm -hmm. Because when you confront data that seems to question you, mm -hmm. you have to have the character to be listening to it. I think that is missing. And how economics. do we get that? That's my question. How? Is how do we get that out there? And how do we get people to realize that more? Well, to, to go through and put yourself on the line, to realize that you're putting yourself on the line and that what you, where you really learn from is by being wrong. That's what I love about experimental economics. I now go to the laboratory. It took me a while to figure this out. I go to the laboratory, and when I am wrong, that's when I'm going to learn something. That's hard. Still, every time I get in there, like, something falls apart. I'm like, I'm like, oh no, I can't publish this. But th that's a moment for me to figure out why. It, and we, we have to be, think of ourselves as being part of the science. And when we're a part of it, then it has to be moral, because I have to be willing to listen to things when I'm wrong. And that, that's what makes science hard. How are we going to change that? Uh, by, I think starting by saying science is not completely objective. Even physics is an objective. Because the scientists, after they've spent their career working on a theory, might at some point have to say, nope, I was wrong. And we have a duty, then, of actually praising somebody for saying, oh, they went through all this work, and then they realized, nope, it works, some, works another way. And not equating being wrong with being a failure. Because science is about the journey. Thank you. mentioned sort of how we do it in economics. So we say, oh, here's this positivist thing. And so we, we say, oh, a minimum wage gives us unemployment. We're making that a claim. Yeah. Unemployment is bad. And this is, this is how I often talk to my students. I say, OK. Look, if you want to come to these normative conclusions, then do it based on the positive analysis. Do it based on the data that we observe and the things that we observe in the realm, right? We don't start with the normative and then mm -hmm. try to work through it because that's difficult, right? So if we're going to make normative claims, we need to start with the positive issue and then see if we can draw our normative viewpoints from that. How does that square, you think, with what we're doing in terms of what we were just talking about? Is it enough to say, OK, let the positive aspects influence and form our normatives? Mm -hmm. Or should we be just out there sort of taking hold of the normative questions? And we can't test them, per se, right? So how do we, how do we integrate this? Well, you can test it by, by coming to grips with facts that may be inconvenient with how you're thinking about things. That's got to be the hardest part about it. Whether you think minimum wages are worse in the net or better in the short run, take the other side of that. Put yourself on the line thing. maybe there could be something good about a minimum wage. And then see how, where, that falls, where that falls flat. Or think that they're going to be do some good and then say, oh, no, they, they oh, I mean, we think that they cause harm, but say, well, what is it that people are driving? Why are they concerned about a minimum wage? Why are they pushing for this? And understand that. If you come in and approach it to students by saying, these are the facts, deal with it, it's a little different than saying, how are you thinking about the world? Let's put that, let's put that to the test. Let's look to see what, what happens to real people when they're facing minimum wages. It puts them as part of the process and not as it's just out there, you better take it. Because I lose 20 to 30% of my students when I teach minimum wage, and I figure out why. It can't all just be them. <laughs> it could be what I'm doing, too. And that is to understand where, where they're coming from and ask them to do the same thing I'm doing. 
be willing to be wrong. The problem with textbooks is they tend to say that this is, we've compiled all these things we know about the world, and that's the way it is. How do we get to that? How do we get to that com compilation? Each generation of students has to go through that whole process themselves. Thank uh, Dr. Wilson one last time. <laughs>